Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In a thought-provoking video, precious metals expert Andy Schechman delves into the complex interplay of economic, political, and international factors that are shaping the world's financial landscape. As he dissects the recent statements by President Biden linking inflation to international figures, Schechman unveils a deeper narrative that transcends traditional economic discussions. With a keen understanding of Austrian economics and a critical eye on global events, Schechman sheds light on how inflation, monetary policy, and geopolitical tensions are converging to redefine economic paradigms. Schechman starts by challenging the notion that inflation can be attributed to a single figure or event, highlighting that inflation is inherently linked to an increase in the money supply, a monetary event rather than the result of any one actor. With a historical perspective, Schechman underscores that the rapid surge in money printing over the past few years, combined with near-zero interest rates, has distorted economic realities on an unprecedented scale. Contrary to pinning the blame on any one individual, the focus should be on the broader monetary policies and the repercussions. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. Biden said this is Putin's inflation. And, and it dawned on me, my goodness, they're looking for a villain. And if you've studied Austrian economics for more than 30 seconds, you know that inflation is always an increase in the money supply. It's a monetary event. And we've printed more money over the last four years than in the history of the country preceding it. In combination with interest rates at or near zero created massive, massive, massive distortions. And, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that, when you say to the world, hey, this is Putin's inflation, and in every single way, that's a lie, it became very transparent to me. They're looking for a villain. So I say that to you because let's look at the 2022 balance sheet of the U.S. government. It's $155 trillion. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and government military pensions being the big four off-balance sheet obligations that are $130, $125 trillion dollars or more. Our largest asset in this country is student debt, representing almost 40 plus percent of, uh, of our assets. Student debt is the largest asset in this country. And I think that there's no question, but they have chosen to, they've chosen the inflation pathway over anything else. Let me just give you an example. When they raised the debt ceiling, uh, they, they increased the debt ceiling by $600 billion in 13 days. And that, that, that's adding $500,000 every second. They've added $1.8 trillion to the national debt in the, last, um, in the last eight weeks. And it took 100, 209 years for this country to get to its, or to accumulate its first $1.8 trillion in debt. We've done it in eight weeks. And so when you talk about unsustainability, there's only a few ways that you can fix this and, and, and you can inflate, you can default, or you can find a villain. And by pushing Saudi Arabia away, by weaponizing the dollar, you have pushed and awoken these countries into cohesion. You have pushed Saudi Arabia away by telling them you're going green, by inflating the currency, by, by destabilizing the bond market, vilifying um, fossil fuel usage, and it would be a whole heck of a lot easier to see the dollar lose its reserve status or its, its petro status. Let's not say the reserve status just yet, but its petro status as a settlement for petrol, which would massively decrease the demand for the dollar. The synthetic demand for the dollar for the last 50 years is extraordinary. Turning to the U.S. government's balance sheet for 2022, Scheckman emphasizes the staggering $155 trillion debt figure, a sum that dwarfs traditional asset values. The four major off-balance sheet obligations, including Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and government military pensions, contribute to the enormity of this debt. What's intriguing is that student debt, representing over 40% of assets, stands as the largest asset in the country. Scheckman's analysis prompts questions about the sustainability of this trajectory and its implications for future generations. 
A pivotal moment in recent economic history was the swift increase of the debt ceiling by $600 billion in just 13 days, akin to adding $500,000 every second. Scheckman contextualizes this rapid debt accumulation by highlighting that it took the United States 209 years to amass its first $1.8 trillion in debt, a figure now attained in a mere eight weeks. The implications of this unprecedented pace raise questions about the viability of addressing such a monumental debt burden. Because Saudi Arabia and because OPEC value oil in dollars, you take that away, that is a massive, massive, massive stake in the heart of, of, of the West. And now you have a villain. It's OPEC and it's Xi Jinping and it's Putin that have created this, this moment. And when I started thinking about that and looking into it, and I came across who the number one economic advisor is for the United States government, I almost fell off my chair. His name is Jared Bernstein, and he wrote a report in 2014, I believe, an op-ed that was picked up in the New York Times called Dethrone King Dollar, in which he advocates immediately for the removal of the world reserve status, that it creates uh, uh, instability, it creates distortions and trade imbalances. And so you have the lead economic advisor for the U.S. advocating for relinquishment of the world reserve status. And if you wanted to do that, I mean, could you think of a better pathway than by first weaponizing the dollar, not just sanctioning Russian assets, but confiscating them and using them to rebuild, so supposedly rebuild the Ukraine, and then telling Saudi Arabia, hey, thanks, but we're gonna go green. So we really, you know, we, we're not gonna be as inclined to, um, uh, to buy as much oil from you forever because this is we're moving away from this. You couldn't draw it up any better. And that really started me down this pathway of thinking, geez, you know, how else do you pay off? How else do you pay off 155 trillion in debt as interest rates are rising and the accumulation of debt is increasing at a pace that the world has never seen? At what point do you realize that there is no way to pay it off? And rather than falling on the sword and being blamed for destroying the American way of life through mismanagement, monetary policy and inflation and 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 the, the brain dead monetary and fiscal policy that we've seen over the last few years, either you fall on the sword and, and go down in history books as being that entity that did it or Better yet, you find a villain, and it was Putin's inflation and OPEC and Xi Jinping and this new alliance of countries that turned their back on the U.S., and they did it. Now, I realize that this is something that is out there. I realize this is something that is controversial. But when you really start to, to dig into things like Jared Bernstein and, and to the movements that we have made, which are so counterintuitive to what we should be doing to cling to the world reserve status, it starts to take shape in my mind. I think either they're really stupid, but I don't think they're really that stupid. I mean, they lie to us. Look, you, you don't have to have ever done cocaine to know that if you have a baggie full of cocaine that, that the Secret Service could, could pull fingerprints off of it, but they said they destroyed it because they thought that was anthrax. It's a Secret Service, the best and the brightest in this country. You don't have to look at what's happening to uh, to the previous administration and the current administration it, it, with the Justice Department and the FBI to, to think to yourselves, is the law being administered equally? You don't have to, to take a look at, at what's happened inside this country at the same time. The, the destabilization of this country, the, the disunification of this country, the, um, the, the, there's just no harmony anymore. We, we have an obsession with cancel culture and censorship and, and, and structural racism and transgenderism. And, and uh, all of these things are eroding us from the inside. Sheckman explores the intriguing geopolitical dimensions that are intertwined with the economic shifts. He argues that the decisions made, such as pushing Saudi Arabia away through the Green Initiative and weaponizing the dollar, have profound implications for global dynamics. These decisions risk alienating key players and in the process may undermine the dollar's dominant status as a reserve currency. By challenging the foundations of dollar hegemony, the landscape of international trade and power balance is undergoing transformative shifts. Delving deeper into the intellectual underpinnings of these decisions, Sheckman discusses Jared Bernstein, the United States government's lead economic advisor. 
Bernstein's advocacy for relinquishing the world reserve status in a 2014 op-ed, coupled with recent policy shifts, raises suspicions about the intention behind these decisions. Scheckman muses about the connection between these policy moves and the objective of dethroning the dollar's global dominance. Scheckman poses a thought-provoking question. Are these trends products of naivety and mismanagement or part of a calculated strategy? He juxtaposes the potential of colossal economic blunders with the possibility of a well-orchestrated effort to redirect blame. As the political and societal fabric within the United States undergoes unsettling changes, Scheckman contends that external observers are also grappling with a perception shift regarding the American identity. We're being eroded from the inside. We're, we're, we're mismanaging the world reserve currency. We are weaponizing the dollar. We are pushing away the linchpin of the, he the dollar hegemony. I mean, at what point is it pure stupidity or at what point does what Klaus Schwab had to say start to resonate in the back of your mind? I mean, and think about it little by little all at once. The, the, that that thesis that, that I have where, you know, you start to see this, this trend that you hear about little by little, then bang, it's in your face. Like all of these things, like, like violence and protest. You know, I left Minneapolis because of violence and protest that was supposedly peaceful. The hell it was peaceful. Minneapolis became a scary place, but the, the inner cities, the, 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 this craziness that we see around us, all around us, do not think for a moment that is not lost on these countries who are coalescing against the West. Look, I said this at Rick's conference, people tied together rafts with string and floated across an ocean to have liberty and justice. We used to say that when, when we said that the Pledge of Allegiance in, in elementary school, liberty and justice for all. Do we have justice? I mean, do we really, are you really being honest with yourself if you say that justice is being applied equally to former President Trump and to the Biden family? With all due respect to the office of the presidency, and I say that sincerely, it bothers me when people denigrate the office of the presidency. You can speak to your feelings of how it's being run or whatnot, but I say that sincerely. And it bothers me more than just about anything. And if it bothers me, what do you think it does to the countries who who or, who look to the United States as that beacon of freedom and liberty? And, and we talk about full faith and credit. I mean, literally, we are broke. We are insolvent, as is the Federal Reserve on their balance sheet. We are broke and insolvent. We have nearly 200 trillion in debt and 5 trillion in assets, of which 40% is student debt. Where is the faith? Where is the credit? People say, who's going to trust China and Russia and, and the disunification there? That is what blockchain and gold would do to create stability and transparency. So was this all done intentionally? I, I don't know, Michelle, you, if, if you wanted to, to draw up a blueprint, you, you weaponize a dollar, you push away Saudi Arabia, and then you make everything inside the country from the banks to to social issues to uh, political issues to justice issues to all of these things to our borders who are we anymore and the world is saying that and that is another rallying cry that gets everyone to the table they'll figure out it out how to make it work and that's what commodities will do to give that that immutability but I think that uh, to to have recency bias and normalcy bias, this isn't the country that a lot of us grew up in. Yeah, that's still the best country in the world. And I'm a huge patriot. And this country gave me opportunities that I never would have gotten anywhere else. And I, and I love this country. But I don't think anyone watching this would be honest with themselves if they thought, where the hell am I all of a sudden? If you woke up after 20 years of, of sleep like Rumpelstiltskin and you, what the hell has happened to this country? And that's how I feel. And I think that's how the world is beginning, if not already has felt for a long time.